Sometimes a prophetic act starts with a revelation. People go, you sense this is where God is going and how will that show up? And sometimes a prophetic act begins with the, the act and then you try to figure out what is God saying and how do we, what, where is he, what is he doing with this? For Kenny and Margie, they approached me. Kenny's my brother, so he has easy access to me. But they approached me. We've been in love with Margie already, as long as we've got to know them. And But about wanting to get married, which we had talked a bit about. But then it, they wanted to get married on, on August the 8th. And it had significance because it was August the 8th, 18. And 8 is always a sign of new beginnings. It's the, you know, the week begins, everything begins new. And um, then we... Margie wanted to, we could start it on at 8 o'clock at 8, 8, 8.18. So that's when we're going to start the wedding. So that, that'll tell you how long I get to talk. So, you know, it can't go on long. And the wedding won't take very long. But we'll break enough that if you have to get yourself moving to your destination, you'll feel comfortable. Just don't walk on the white stuff. Go that way. Because that's for Margie to enter. Anyway, I've done weddings on Sunday mornings. I've done weddings uh, in my office on Tuesday afternoons. I've done weddings at beaches. I've done weddings at hotels. I've done weddings uh, here on Saturdays and Sundays. But I don't think I've ever done a Wednesday night wedding. So that was, that was interesting. So once, once the date was set, which come to find out, and I'll probably want to mention this in, in Margie's presence too, but, but Margie came to the United States from Korea 30 years ago today. So there's just something, but so I know there is importance for them and we accommodate all of our body and love, it's not a problem for us to do this, but I started asking, Lord, now what are you, what are you saying in this? Because it's not just a random act. Um, if there's something that's significant probably for all of us, guests and the body. And he really began to talk to me about redemption and the kinsman redeemer, which is a biblical term about when a couple or a person died or someone lost their inheritance because of they grew poor, they had to sell what they you know had. There, it was embedded into Israeli uh, customs and law that one of your nearest kinsmen, you know, your your uncle, your brother, could come back, come up and redeem the property. It was not a choice that the new owner had. He had to give it back to you at the rate of, at the right price because you, God wanted always all of us to have an inheritance. And inheritance wasn't something we were going to earn. It was something that was given to us and he would always want to find a way to restore it. So there's this, um, was this young Moabite girl and she's, you know, lived in Moab, and she fell in love with an Israeli who had left Israel. And this is back in the time of Judges. And when he, they had come out of Israel because there was a famine, so they moved their family, and she fell in love with one of the boys. There were two sons, and mother-in-law Naomi, and a father. And what happened is they get married, and she falls in love with the family, and she falls in love with God, the, the, the Israeli God. There was a totally different religious belief system with Moab and Israel. But over a course of time, uh, her father-in-law, uh, the, her husband's dad, passes away. And then, about 10 years later, both the brothers pass away. So now you have Ruth, her mother Naomi, her mother-in-law Naomi, and her um, other sister Ophrah. And Naomi hears that back home in Israel, it's, it's getting good again. There's, there's, there's bread, there's food, there's livelihood. So she says, you know, I'm just, there's nothing for me here. You guys have been the best, best, but I'm going home. And to her surprise, both of the girls said, we want to go with you. So they start the journey out of the city and get a little out, little out of the outskirts. And Naomi, who's the mother-in-law, turns to Ruth and to Ophrah, the two daughter-in-laws, and say girls, there's nothing here for you. You, you, even if I was to carry a child in my womb, if I was even pregnant today, which is no hope for that to happen, but even if I was, would you wait for one of my, a son to grow up 
and then marry them, which was a part of a custom of, again, raising, keeping an inheritance in a family. And so, with much persuasion, Oprah said, okay, I, I don't want to leave you. I love you. You're precious to me. And with kisses and sorrows, and she leaves. And then Naomi says to Ruth, why don't you follow your, your sister's uh, example? And Ruth then makes this incredible statement. And it's, it's a powerful statement. I want to just read it. Because I believe this goes far beyond marriage. This goes into the whole idea of maturing in our faith and our relationship with God and the work, how what he does to take us into that. And so, right after Judges comes Ruth. She makes a statement. It's famous. You've probably even heard it or read it on a card before. Ruth said... Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. The story goes on, and I want to make a first point. Jesus, when he returns and collects his church, which is the the formation of his bride, and that bride is received to him, it will be what we call a consummate bride, a bride who has fully been prepared, matured, of equal stature to Christ, having been tested, having learned the faithfulness of God, having trusted, and the two will meet, and we will be that bride coming together. So there's a lot of, a lot of life is about the maturing process. And one of the things that I have found that is key to anyone who will journey with Jesus and journey into their future and re- come into their inheritance is you have to be unwilling to stop following. And you can't ever look to anyone other than Jesus to be the primary resource that you're going to find life from. Ruth had to look at her mother-in-law, Naomi, and go, you know what, I don't know that I can get any future from you, but I do believe there's a future in God. And I'm going for him. And I believe the God you follow is the one I want to follow. So I'm sticking with you, but not because you're going to give me life. God will give me life. So she arrives, they arrive in Bethlehem. And Naomi, by this time, as any mother and any wife would be, is basically totally wrecked, traumatized, heartbroken. They all get up excited. Oh, it's Naomi, it's Naomi. Where was she finally? She says, don't call me Naomi. I left full. And now the Lord sent me back with nothing. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because that's what I am. So they park, they get settled into their home, and Ruth comes with the second step into maturity. I don't know why it is like this, but she says to her mother, can I go and let me go and glean in the fields? It was a biblical uh, pattern put into the law that whenever you were to harvest your field, you had to leave the corners untouched. And if things fell to the ground, you had to just allow them so the poor could come and collect the food that they couldn't afford to buy, but if they took the time to work, they could gather it. So Ruth is uh, permitted to do so, and she's out in the field. And by chance, he comes into the, the field of this wealthy landowner named Boaz. Now, Boaz happens to be a kinsman redeemer, a relative, a close relative, but Ruth doesn't know that. And when she starts to work, about noon, Boaz comes to the field to in- inspect how things are going. And he says, well, who's that lady? And to, she goes, oh, that's, it's that young Moabitess who's shown up. Ah, oh, so he goes over to her and he says, I don't want you to leave any of these workers. Stay with them through the harvest. C- collect what they have. Um, I've been, in, and Ruth is like, oh, going, how can you be so kind to me? I'm not like you. I don't have your customs. I don't look like you. Why are you this? He said, I've, it's been told by everyone, your kindness you've shown to your mother-in-law. So you've come to seek refuge under the wings of God. So all of a sudden, Ruth is like being, finding favor. Because whenever we lay down our life to serve, 
whoever it is that God joins us to in our pursuit of the Lord, there will come a new favor. Favor will find us because favor follows that heart of humility. Because Ruth, Ruth could have been saying, okay, well, we're in this great place. Let's take care of me. But Ruth said, no, how can I take care of you, Naomi? So it just gets better because now, by the time Boaz is leaving back home, he tells his workers, make sure you leave some stuff for her. And if she gets ahead of you and collects something that wouldn't be appropriate, don't you ever reprove her and don't you touch her and let her eat with you and let her drink the water that you draw. And so Ruth comes home with this bag full of barley and she's like, her mother-in-law is going, where'd you get all this? Well, I just happened into this field. His, uh, the owner is Boaz. And she goes, oh, of course. Boaz, he's a kinsman. He's a relative. And, and he said, don't leave his fields until the harvest is over. And she said, that's exactly what you need to do. Stay, stay the course. The third thing that people find, that I found, is that once we have made the decision to follow the Lord, next, humbling ourselves to serve in whatever capacity, the third thing is just consistency, not stopping. Just stay the course because on the other side is something wonderful. So by the time the harvest, they go through a barley harvest, a wheat harvest, about the end of this, it comes to Naomi. Remember, Naomi's just bitter, angry, traumatized and being cared for by her daughter-in-law. And Naomi comes and says, you know what, I've got to look out for your good. You have a, I, there's a future ahead of you and I know how we can do it. Because Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. So what you're going to do, Ruth, is I want you to put on your best dress and there is a, there's a, there's a, a party tonight. It's going to be right there at the threshing floor. Uh, uh, they celebrate the end of the harvest and they're going to, their men are going to be happy and by the time they drink, they're full. I want you to just know where does Boaz just lay his head to go to sleep. And then when everybody's asleep and it's fully dark, I want you to come up Sneak up to where he's laying. I want you to uncover his feet and lay at the base of his feet perpendicular. And then when he wakes, you're to ask him to redeem you. So she does as her mother-in-law tells her, which is another key in the future that we all are desiring, is we have to be willing to listen to those that we've loved and served and who have covenant that we don't yet have they want us to enter into they open a door for us Boaz in the middle of the night wakes up he freaks out what is this on the bottom of my feet he looks at who are what and she says I am Ruth your servant please redeem me and he says I will he's he's flabbergasted because he's older than her and she's thinking you are more virtuous at the end than in the beginning because you're not only didn't seek younger men, whether they're rich or poor, you you come this course. And of course I'll redeem you, but there's somebody that's ahead of me. They're closer relatives. So let me go in the morning and we'll sort this out. But don't you go home empty-handed because you need to have any fills or sacks full of barley. (laughs) And when he says, when, when it's just before dawn, get up and get out so no one has to see that you've been here. No one should know that. So she gets up, carrying the barley, comes to her mother-in-law and says, this is what happened. Here's the barley. And her mother-in-law says, sit down, my daughter, and rest. Because he, he will not give, he will, he will be, he will not, he will finish this matter today. And there's something about redemption, the way God loves to take us into our, the season that he planned for us, the future that he had, the future we wanted we didn't know how to get to, is that when it comes time to, to act on it, the Lord, because Lo, Boaz is like a Jesus, a picture of Jesus, because Jesus be, was the kinsman redeemer for us, and he became man, and then he found a way to bring us into, back into our inheritance. But when it comes time, there's just, things can go pretty quick. So Boaz goes to the the gate where all the elders of the city would gather and he calls a few men together and then he calls a close relative and he says, Ruth the Moabite and Naomi have returned and I want you to redeem their property. And and he says, sure, I'll do that. And he goes, but you have to take Ruth now as your wife and raise up heirs for her. And he's going, then all of a sudden this relative says, I can't do that because it'll mess up my own inheritance. So 
Boaz says, well, then I will. And there's something about the love that God shows us that is just when you start to touch goodness, as he just says, I'm, I'm after you. And I will, I, will, I will choose to join myself to your future, to bring you into future. And so can you imagine what must have happened that day? It is, uh, let me just read it, because it's, it's like crazy. I should have kept my place. And I, if, this, if you've ever read the story, it's a, it's a great little story, like four chapters. And it's one of those love stories. But here it is. Here it was. It's somewhere in the Bible, right? All right. Chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4 and um, verse 9. And Boaz says to the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Emelik's. That was uh, Naomi's husband. And all that was Chilion's and all that was Mullen's. Those were the two brothers from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malone, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And there is something that whenever you touch that that magnanimousness of God, that over-largeness of the way he comes to bring us into the future that it just invokes blessing and and all the people who are at the gate and the elders said we are witnesses the lord make the woman who is coming to your verse 11 the lord make the woman who is coming to your house uh like rachel and leah the two matriarchs and the two who built the house of israel may you prosper in ephrath and be famous in bethlehem and may your house be like the house of perez whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. There's something about redemption that opens a prophetic future, opens promises that would have seemed to be impossible. And I believe this is the the, the place we're in tonight. Ruth and Boaz marry and she has a son. And she conceived, verse 13, and she bore a son. Then verse 14 the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord. Now we're talking to the bitter, angry mo- mother in law who's all of a sudden found herself in fruitfulness. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter in law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. And the neighbor uh, women gave him a name saying, this is the son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. Now here for those of you biblicalists and like to follow the storyline. Obed, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. David is King David that we've seen movies about and that we read and wrote all the Psalms. So she becomes, in effect, the great-grandmother of David. Just through a simple, I value God. Don't tell me to leave. I'm going to travel with you. I'm not looking to you to make change my life. I'm looking to the future that I believe this God I, I've come to love. I will serve you any capacity that is required and I will not require from you something back. I will be patient. I will continue. And then when, it, when I discover what you're asking, I go, yeah, I can go in that new way. That's something I've never learned, but I'm, I can go in there. And then celebration. Now, there's a story, and I won't take this time because I am watching the clock. In the book of Revelations, which is the last book of the Bible, and it's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, There's a chapter 7, it's a marking chapter about the church and the bride. There's a chapter 19, which is is a description of the wedding feast. And there's a chapter 21, which is a description of the, of the, the bride coming down from heaven. In chapter 19, it talks about this celebration that comes. And it says, the bride has made herself ready. 
And then in chapter 7, earlier, we see how we make ourselves ready. You would tend to think, again, we think of weddings and marriage and, and everything starts when we were young and from there it kind of just grows old. Whereas in the kingdom, we start with, the, our, hopefully our hearts start when we're young and we embark to go follow after God, but we really don't become beautiful in God's sight until we're very old or older because we start to have made choices again and again to value what he has accomplished. It says, it, the, it says she'd made herself uh, uh, ready and is now adorned with be- these bridal gowns. And in chapter 7, it says the way we get our bridal gowns beautiful is through the blood of the Lamb. Which means that when we go through testings in life, and I'm sure everybody here has gone through some testings, we have a lot of options on how we deal with them. Sometimes we can get out of them, sometimes we can blame others, sometimes we just suffer under it, we just collapse under the weight of them. I've done all of it. But then there's those times when we just start to say, you know, I, I've got to apply what Jesus accomplished into my life so that what he accomplished can be the answer to this problem, whatever it is. That's what it means when we say we made our garments white with the blood. In other words, we say to ourselves and in prayer and to the situation, your blood, your death on the cross, your burial, your resurrection three days later, your ascension another 40 days later, your place as a high priest, as a seated at the right hand of God, forever now making intercession, collecting us up, I'm going to give you the access to my life. And I believe you are the answer of whatever situation. I'll read this in a little bit with when Margie and Ken are standing up here. But in Hebrews chapter 8, is a quotation of a covenant promised in uh, Jeremiah 31. And the covenant that God promised in Jeremiah 31 is what we now refer to in the New Testament as the new covenant. And he makes it clear in Jeremiah 31, 31, and then in Hebrews, he says, I brought you out of Egypt. I took you by the hand, carried you with eagle's wings. I brought you, I made covenant. I wanted to be a husband to you, take care of you, but you wouldn't stay in the covenant. So, it just... I'm going to make a new covenant. I mean, God is so good. He saw that the covenant he had made was perfect, but we couldn't walk in it. So he said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And what he says is, this is the covenant I'm going to make with you. And this is the basis. This, I'm sorry, this is good theology, but this is the basis of Christian faith. Is that I will make a new covenant with you. I will put my laws in your mind. I'll write them in your heart. I will begin to be the one who helps you know me versus having to try to learn and observe me. I'm going to put my words in your mouth, in your heart, your mind, and you won't have to try to get others to know me because I will make myself known to everyone. I will make myself known to whoever wants to know me. And you know how I'm going to do it? You're going to love this. And this is for all of us tonight. I don't care who we are or how we got here. This is for all of us tonight. Everybody online watching us. He says, I'm going to know you from the least of you to the greatest of you will know me for I will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins, your lawless deeds. I will remember no more. So I'm going to, I'm going to do more in this new covenant than I asked then you asked me to do in the first covenant, which you could never keep the first. I'm going to be a forgiver. This, this is, and, and I'll get on. The, I'll get Margie and Ken on this. This is about forgiveness. Life is about forgiveness. Love is about forgiveness. The future is about forgiveness. Your future is in forgiveness. Our knowing God is in being forgiven, and then releasing forgiveness. And when we, when we can do that. We enter into a knowing God. And every time we do, something of himself, something of his ways are put into our mind and written in our heart and we begin to have a relationship with God, not on our own self-righteousness or works and how hard we're trying to be good, but because we receive forgiveness. And the forgiveness comes and we go, I can't believe it, here I am again. And every time he forgives me, I learn something about him. It was humbling at first because I was young when I got saved and I thought I could do pretty good, pretty good stuff for God. And when I got older, I realized I couldn't. And then I started to discover through the scriptures that he never thought I would. In fact, it's very proud of me to think that I could measure up on some kind of performance with God. 
but I could know him by being forgiven. So I used to live trying to never need to be forgiven. See how long I could go without sinning. I don't know how long your record is. Mine's not probably very long. Either I ignore it all, that's how I go really far. But you know, sin is just selfishness, just getting an, getting an attitude, choosing your own way, you know, under your breath, thinking that the management at whatever in, uh, place you're at has really needs, you know, to be re- redefined because you can't get into the line, the tellers are late. It's just, it's just self. But every time I'm forgiven, I know God. So now I want to always get forgiven. I go through the day going, I see my problems, but I want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. And the funny thing about forgiveness is Jesus did this incredible, I mean, radical theology. He said in his day, he said, when you stand praying, forgive anyone who you have anything against because if you forgive, your Father will forgive you. If you will not forgive, your Father cannot forgive you. That's the crazy thing about forgiveness. It's a two-way street. It's not one way. And once we stop one direction, it stops the other direction. And that's why we can live as Christians, believers, well-meaning, good, outstanding citizens and have this kind of like, things just won't release. I'm just frustrated. I'm mad. I'm, it's not working right. Because the forgiveness isn't flowing. So I want to just close our, t- our time together so we can ke- take advantage of this glorious moment in a few minutes by letting God release forgiveness. And it'll be as simple as believing his provision. See, the reason Jesus, God can forgive us all now is because Jesus paid for everything. It'd be like having the richest man in the world coming into your life and saying, I have need of you, I love you, I want you in my life, and you're in debt, or you're in prison, or you have no way out. And he says, I will undo all of that so that you can follow me. That's what Jesus did. And then, when he came and released that sound of forgiveness, he said, the only condition, though, is that you have to release everybody else. Every day, in any way. Because I'm going to forgive you and always forgive you. So I'm going to ask that you forgive everyone and always forgive them. Wow. And we're about to celebrate a night of glory. Love being formed, beginning afresh, forgiveness, giving, forgiving. It's going to be awesome. But let's take a moment and see if we can gain some of that stuff. So if you'll just, just close your eyes and bow your head for just a minute and just think about just Jesus. If you desire this Jesus, if, if this would be something that could release for you a help, tell the Lord. All you have to say is, Jesus... I, I want to know you. I want to, I want to experience the value that you carry, that, this, that others seem to, to give you praise and thanksgiving over. I want to be forgiven. Please forgive me. In fact, I'll just lead us in a simple prayer together. You can pray it out loud. Just if this is part of your desire, just pray it with us. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for Jesus, what you gave me in Christ. I believe he died for my sins, raised from the dead, and tonight I receive you afresh. I forgive, and I receive forgiveness. Thank you for this new covenant. I ask you to renew this new covenant in me. I release every person that is contending against me. And I choose to receive your forgiveness in the same way. Thank you for being so kind. Thank you for revealing to me your love. Oh, thank you for your provision that I might live a fresh and new life. Bring me into the maturity of love because I want to be at that wedding feast you've got planned. The wedding feast of the Lamb. Jesus, the Lord, and the bride, his church. Let it, let it come quickly, but let me be ready.
I thank you for doing this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.